the last one's the one everybody's happy about, except for just you know. Except for you. Why? What are you gonna? Because what are you gonna do while you're in the waiting room now? <laughs> it's supposed to be there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still gonna do the same thing I always do. I just don't have to sign the paper. I don't get to walk up there and go, you want me to sign this, but I haven't seen it. You're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, where HIPAA and humor collide to make learning fun. Your delightful hosts are Donna Grindle and David Sims. Relax, HIPAA help is on the way. Michelle Lombard from Georgia Spine Orthopedics, and you're listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast. Welcome to episode 291 of the Help With HIPAA podcast. My name is David Sims of HIPAA for MSPs and Security First IT. Joining me is Donna Grendel of Carden. Good afternoon, Donna. (laughs) No, we we got a lot going on, man. We're having to spend way too much time together on all of our business ventures. I know. I know. Some people would think it would be really cool to hang out with you, but I'm here to tell you, it can be exhausting. (laughs) (laughs) Right back at you, brother. Right back at you. (laughs) Oh, I'm sure of it. (laughs) Hanging out with me is rough. I do it every day. I know. Yeah. It's like, (laughs) I live in my head. You don't want to know what's in it. (laughs) That is true. I was, uh, my wife comes through the house the other day. She's like, what are you listening to? And I'm like, Mozart. She's like, that loud? (laughs) Yeah. Isn't that awesome? (laughs) She's like. Why are you listening to classical music so loud? I'm like, to calm the voices in my head. <laughs> <laughs> I love just blasting classical music when it's like really good. Yep. Yeah, that's always funny. The weird thing is, she, no matter what I'm listening to, she's always like, what are you listening to? Because I go through all these different genres. Like mm-hmm. the other day I was listening to some big band music of the 40s. Oh, yeah. <laughs> she's like, what are you listening to? I'm like. Big band music. Do you know what that is? <laughs> uh, it's funny because I'm just all over the place. You just never know. I love some uh, of that Bollywood music. I, I know. love that. So, but yeah, yeah. I, I have always been a very eclectic music person, just as you. Another weird reason that we get along. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we I, honestly, we've been, we've known each other. Almost a decade, what, nine years now? Oh, wow. Something like that. But we just discovered like a week or so ago that you and I both were in marching band. (laughs) Band captain. Yeah. I was a drum major. Yeah. That's right. So, So. alto sax. Trombone player right here. There you go. Yep. That's right. I was always, boy, I have a lot of stories about Marching band and concert band. One time at band camp. <laughs> That's how a lot of stories start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which, I, uh, I, yep. There are a lot of stories about being in the band. People yeah. do well, not know. It was probably like nowadays, at least up, up here, it's, you know, band is like, what? You're in the band? But back oh, in no. the day, it was like, oh, dude, you're in the band. That's amazing. Because Not everywhere. I mean, the band, those bands now, they get to travel, and my nephews are in the marching band in their school up in Baldwinville, Bald, Bald, Baldwinsville, <laughs> New York, mm-hmm. and they got to go to like march in the Macy's Parade and go down and march at Disney and perform at NASA, and this is just really cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, I marched in the Disney Parade. Being the drum major, guess what? I had to walk backwards through the whole parade. <laughs> One of the bad parts about being drum major. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, in the parades that we were always in, it was like out, you know, North Georgia parades where there were horses and you always, why did they oh. put the band behind the, you, okay, you're with yeah. me and you were doing it backwards. I was yeah. just watching for the line in front of me to go around. Yeah. <laughs> I was fortunate that I never like bumped in anybody, but. Yeah, so. well, the horses, it's not the people that you're worried about. Mm-mm. No. <laughs> it's their trail. Watch your step. <laughs> so, yeah, lot, lots of cool stuff. Now, I know locally, like when I was in the band, I think our size of our band was like 300 members. Oh, yeah, I know. And um, now this included the the flag core and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. But the last time I went to a local football game, 
couple of years ago, it was it was sad because the band was maybe thirty or forty people. Wow. And I was like, man, we used to have more than that in the in the pep band that we would just send to pep rallies. It was bigger than that. Yeah. So it's it's died off a lot, which is kind of sad because well, they're not a, funding music programs as much as they used to either. And music is math. And yeah. and a lot of other things. So I it that's why I support a lot of the you know the Divas Las Vegas and those kind of things about making sure there's music in schools. I think it mm-hmm. made us what we are. Whether that's a oh, good yeah. thing or not, we'll leave to others to decide. So it's why we know about HIPAA. That's it. That's it. So early on in our lives, we were introduced to acronyms, <laughs> right? It was uh, F-A-C-E and mm-hmm. every good boy does fine. Or, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all the, all the tricks you uh, learn to – um, to memorize things, you know, mm-hmm. all that gets taught to you in music. But the other, the other thing is how amazing it is that you can take music like that and learn it so quickly and memorize so much of it. Mm-hmm. And um, just a lot of stuff like that was really cool. Kind of pushes you to outside of your comfort zones. But are you the type of person that listens to music based on how you feel, or do you listen to music to change how you feel? Both. Okay. You know, I listen, there's, I subscribe to brain.fm and it has music that's geared specifically for things. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm a fan of that. But then other times I'm like, you know, I want to get focused. Okay, I'm going to listen to that. But you know what? I feel chill. Listen to some of the lounge chill music or jazz chill or Oh, you know, I want to listen to 80s rock or Mm -hmm. pop or, you know, or like you, oh, the 40s station. One of the coolest things I ever found was a 1920s radio station Mm -hmm. that was being, I love that one because you got the little scratch and that's cool stuff. Yeah. It was interesting, but we digress. Yes, we do, oftentimes. But <laughs> interesting stuff, nonetheless. Yes. Speaking of interesting stuff, the HIPAA Boot Camp, yes. virtual edition, February 23, 24, 25. We got just a few more slots open. It's almost maxed out. Yep. I think we were looking for two or three, I think. So, yep. although when this comes out, you're running out of time. I don't know. Let us know if you're. Want to join us? It's going to be cool. We got it all changed up. We're covering a, a lot of new stuff and uh, expanding our bandwidth. Mm-hmm. So, so if you want to know more about that, go to thehippobootcamp.com. Mm-hmm. Again, thehippobootcamp.com. There you go. H-I-P-A-A. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I think maybe I bought the misspelling of it. I don't know if I did or not, but I probably should. <laughs> yeah. I know, right? The domain. I actually had somebody showing me is a startup, and they were showing me, explaining me what they had, and they showed how it had a pop up saying something about HIPAA, and it was misspelled. And I just stopped and said, "By the way, there's no PP in HIPAA." Yeah, um, I'm accepting applications for a position we have in the company, a tech position, and of course, within the job description, is like you know, familiarization with HIPAA would be a plus, mm-hmm. and somebody. Sends thing back and like I've been in IT for five years and uh, I am familiar with compliance in HIPAA. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh, yeah, you're f- you're so familiar with it, you can't even spell it. There you go. Anyway, yeah. that'll mm-hmm. happen. there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So, any other announcements you have? Uh, not right now. I'm sure I'll okay, think of good. something in a second. Good deal. All right. So before we uh, dive into the episode, which is going to be talking about privacy rule proposed changes. Yeah. That's right. That is right. And some of these are going to be like, oh my gosh, more work. <laughs> <laughs> not all of them, though. You know, no, not all of them. Good. So some of it's going to be good. Some of it's going to be like, oh, how are we going to do that? Yeah. But uh, definitely things you need to know if you have to deal in the privacy rule 
uh, section and sector of HIPAA. So stay tuned for all that. But first, before we do that, I do want to give a shout out to Jack Polterak, if I didn't butcher that last name. <laughs> <laughs> Did I butcher it? Do you think I got I, it right? I got nothing. I, I, I'm going to just hope that he's kind and forgiving and he can tell us how to pronounce it properly. Yeah. But, uh, but Jack is, uh, you know, every episode we always say, help spread the word and, you know, share it out on social media. We say that every single episode. And, and Jack has just been one that has constantly been stepping up lately and, and doing that. And uh, just want to say we appreciate that, Jack. Thank you very much. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, indeed. All righty. So before we dive into our episode, as a matter of fact, today's episode, you know, we usually do the, the HIPAA say what, but today's episode is the entire thing is HIPAA say what. So yeah. uh, so we're not going to have the special segment, but I know some of you just love to hear that. So <laughs> right for the break, we'll play it and get into it. There you go. Two-thirds of small businesses that experience a cybersecurity breach end up closing their doors within six months. Cyber criminals are targeting your practice and coming after your most sensitive data. Visit us online and schedule a time to talk about what you can do to protect yourself, your patients, and your practice. Our website is securityfirstit.com. That's securityfirstit.com. Does your business work with medical practices? As a medical practice business associate, do you realize that if you have access to patient information, you have to follow the same HIPAA rules as your client? Call Cardin today at 678-292-5001 so they can assess your privacy and security practices to help ensure you are protected and prepared. Visit CardinHQ.com to learn more. All right, welcome back. Now it's time for the HIPAA. Say what? The entire episode. <laughs> Uh, I do want to say, though, before we jump into the privacy rule proposed changes, that there's been a couple of things happening in the ransomware or cybersecurity space here lately that mm -hmm. probably deserves just a quick mention. Don't have time to go down the rabbit holes on them. But um, one is that, you know, the, the Emotet uh, ransomware that we've talked about a lot because it's caused a lot of problems, some international policing and stuff like that have, have been happening. And they actually found where this is originated from. And my understanding is they, they shut the server down. Well, um, Emotet is the one that's the dropper. So it, it's malware that goes to command and control and gets additional malware and spreads it. So there may be more than one, but they found a huge one that has been providing a lot of traffic. So th that alone helps everyone it's a huge mm -hmm. piece of news and i don't know who all you know it could have been interpol and fbi and all those folks but law enforcement has shut down at least for a little while one of the big spreaders of malware yeah and we rarely have good news when we're talking about ransomware <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, there's a different. I don't know the name of the ransomware gang. I can't recall, but they did find like shut down a ransomware gang too. So they had a couple of big things in the news from a law enforcement perspective on cybersecurity, which was great this week. So mm -hmm. yay FBI or yep. whoever cybersecurity police that's shutting it all down. That's right. Yay. And now we have to figure out what happens with the courts and whether or not they are as tough on them as they should be. Or that they can even bring charges. Mm, yeah. It depends on countries That's, and all that kind of stuff. It gets complicated. Yep. So be interesting to watch. Yep. All right. So let's dive into the privacy rule proposed changes. Yes. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, we've mentioned it. It's been out there since December, and I've been trying to figure out what to do about it. But. It's a frequent enough conversation that I think that we really need to make sure everybody that uh, relies on us for explaining stuff, that we explain what's going on. Mm -hmm. So there's this NPRM, Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, that was published by HHS uh, OCR in December. And so they say, hey, we've submitted this to the Federal Register for proposed rulemaking process. and you know, let everybody know what goes in it. And then the federal register publishes 
this and it's open for a certain amount of time for comment about this proposed rules and then they take it and they look at all the comments and then they publish what the final rule is and then you got like 60 days before it takes effect and then uh, you know, there's there's all these time frames, and then 180 days for implementation, and then enforcement, blah blah blah. So, under normal conditions, which <laughs> we are so, I don't know why we keep saying that because I don't even know what normal is anymore. But um, so uh, because of the transfer or the transition. To the new administration, this is normally a little confusing time. And so the Biden administration published on the 20th there, you know, we want all agencies to review all the proposed, the NPRMs. And if it hasn't gone to federal registry yet, you know, hold it for review to make sure we want to send it. If it's already there, potentially extend the comment period to get new thoughts added all these things, because we want to review them and decide what to do. Now, this one we already knew everybody was going to, you know, this could take a lot of reviews and a lot of rounds. There could be an interim rule and these kind of things. Well, I don't know what's going to, because the memo that said if it hasn't been published, you know, try to withdraw the, it it got published the next day. (laughs) So it was like already in the loop. So you can go out there and comment on it now, and it's probably if you are someone interested in making comments to these things, it is a very good thing for you to go out and review if there's any of these things that you feel like, I don't know if I how I feel about that, or you want to make comments about how things are handled, then go out there to the Federal Register. Uh, we'll have a link to the NPRM on the Federal Register. You can go there. I do not know because of all of this and those time frames and the amount of discussion and all of the other priorities, I am not certain <laughs> what, what will happen with this. But in theory, it would be something towards the end of the year we would be implementing these things. So obviously, you've got to be thinking about them in case that does happen. So that's why we're going to go ahead and talk about them. And make sure that it's at least on your radar because it could just all of a sudden you got 60 days, 180 days to get these implemented. You need to be ahead of the game, which is why you listen to Help Me With HIPAA, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. So these are in kind of the best I could, you know, pluck out in kind of layman terms or as close as you would get to what we could discuss that way. So there's a a list of them, and we're going to go through them. Some of them are real quick and straightforward. And uh, a couple of them, I'm like, well, that makes complete sense. Just do it, you know. (laughs) And others, Mm -hmm. it's kind of like, I'm going to have to think about that. So number one was facilitate disclosure of PHI for individuals experiencing certain health emergencies by modifying the standard for disclosures from saying that you can disclose based on professional judgment to one that is good faith belief. And that gets into legal terminology there because a lot of people say, well, what's the definition of professional judgment? Because that hadn't been done. And does professional judgment mean that I have to have a license in this area and be trained on it is that what makes me a professional and it, you know it sends lawyers and and people that worry about that kind of level of terminology down a rabbit hole we have always said look everything in hipaa says patient care comes first ocr has repeatedly said patient care comes first so there you go we would just say you know when it gets down to it the bottom line is could you sit in court and explain why you thought that this was in the patient's best interest. And by changing this, it kind of gets rid of a a lot of that confusion over it and just say it's good faith. Now, one of the concerns I have is, all right, well, now anybody could say it was a good faith. I had 
faith in the fact that what I knew was to be true instead of using judgment. And so Mm -hmm. to me, professional judgment, it was easier for me to direct people in using the term professional judgment than it will be in good faith, potentially. But again, yeah. this gets back to, you know, that whole legal debate. So this this one could bring up more more questions than it does answers. Well, well it's going to answer some questions, but will it create others is my thing. Mm-hmm. You know, because right now when I say use your professional judgment, the vast majority of people don't nitpick that. But this mm-hmm. is the law and it needs to be addressed. So what about the part where it's talking about certain health emergencies? Like what is, what is that? Well, you know, a lot of this has to do with things they learned in the opioid crisis where people believe that, okay, well, I am not a specialist in addiction treatment, so I can't tell the family that even, you know, that this is, you need to help this person with their addiction. They are addicted. It is not just they don't feel good. Right. Mm-hmm. And that you still have the concern about am I the person, the right person to be saying that because I don't have that knowledge of addiction. Right. So, right. I think that's where a lot of this came from. And that makes sense. But on the flip side of that, you've got to look at this applying across the broad spectrum. So now, you know, does it mean that? And I always have to look at this from divorce cases and child custody cases and all of that because that's when it gets abused the most, HIPAA, that is. And professional judgment, it was a little bit easier to be clear than, well, I had good faith belief that the mother's story about what was happening was true, so I told the children, you know, I mean – it, it kind of gets, it kind of creates this whole new thing that may come up. I don't know, but it, it again gets terminology. And the bottom line for me is patient care comes first. And other than the legal definition, I would still tell you to do the same thing that I've told everybody to do before is if you believe and you have, you know, bounce it off somebody else that has the same understanding to make sure you're not missing anything and you believe that this is in the best interest of the patient and you would be willing to sit in court and testify that, then go ahead. Do what you Mm -hmm. believe is right in patient care. I agree. Oh, thank you. (laughs) Uh, You know, because, I mean, that's all any of us can do. And if if you're really there to care for the patient, let us figure out, let the lawyers figure out the other stuff. Okay, so this is in the same area which mm-hmm. is to expand a uh, threat, avert a threat to health or safety when harm is serious and reasonably foreseeable instead of serious and imminent. Okay. Now, that one I get because it's reasonable. And a lot of this, same thing, opioid, but also mental health issues. And I really see it in a lot of the mental health issues. Is it imminent? You know, I I remember the interviews after the uh, Colorado theater shooting. Mm -hmm. And yes, the individual showed signs that they may do this. But had they made enough of a specific threat, and, you know, when you get into legal terms, a specific threat is I'm going to, on this day, come in and shoot a bunch of people in this theater. Okay, then it's imminent. So right. what they're saying is change it so that it's foresee it's reasonably foreseeable that this would happen. So now I don't have to look for that imminent threat of somebody overdosing or somebody, you know, doing something along those lines. So again, yeah. but at the same time, is that going to be abused on the flip side? Probably. <laughs> And it's, it's always child custody and divorce cases, almost always. Mm-hmm. But again, it has to do with the patient's care. And, uh, you know, it's a tough call because – and it always goes back to people that are going to abuse the privilege of having access to patient information. 
Right. Then modify the definition of healthcare operations to include care coordination and case management. And care coordination, case management is kind of a really big thing so that they can make sure that people are doing, they're taking their meds, they're going to their visits, they're doing their therapy instead of just going, hey, go do this. And then if people, for whatever reason, I can't get off work or I didn't like that person or any number of things, if for whatever reason, they're not doing it, you know, or they just need help figuring it out. That's where this care coordination case management comes in. But again, who's doing that work, right? So what they're doing is saying that healthcare operations includes care coordination because a lot of the health plans are having care coordination and case management functions within their health plan. And if in the health plan itself, they're doing care coordination, well, that's not necessarily treatment. The health plan doesn't provide treatment. So they had to classify that under healthcare operations. Again, the care coordination and case management makes great sense, but I have the same concern about it that I do about HIEs. I mean, HIEs give me the willies. (laughs) <laughs> because anybody that has access to the HIE can take the data. There's really no rules. It's the Wild West out there on those HIEs. I'm just telling you. Mm-hmm. No one is tracking who is getting the data. So there it goes. Same kind of change in allowing case management to talk with social and community services organizations because especially, again, in the opioid crisis, we get somebody, we get them out of rehab, we're trying to manage their case and trying to move them forward, and now they can't figure out housing or, you know, how to take advantage of some of these other services that are available in the community, and we need to connect them and and bring those people together and not just leave it to the patient because we're not allowed to talk to them. The same kind of thing here. This I thought was really interesting. Never thought about it. Makes complete sense when somebody points it out. You know, the TRS service where it's kind of like you, a deaf person can have a service that's like speaking for them on a telephone mm-hmm. call or whatever. Yeah. So it always been a thing that a patient could do that and, and you would provide services if the patient's talking with you. The patient had the services, but what about the flip side that I have an employee that needs to use those services to talk to the patient? That hadn't been addressed. And now they include that as a business associate definition. So now you can provide those services as a business associate. It's very clear that that's where it falls. I'm sure there was a lot of, we are, we aren't, we are, we aren't, we are, we aren't. That's all done. (laughs) that solves it. So see, those are a lot of them. And the next one, the next one is including the U S public health service commission Corps and the uh, national oceanic and atmospheric commission administration commission Corps. you know, including those which are considered unified services as part of the exception under armed forces that, you can discuss patients' information with military command. Okay, well, that, that makes sense. You know, again, yeah. so all of them make sense. Now, are there comments based on the confusions that I mentioned and potential areas? Probably needs to be discussed to make sure and vet it. But so far, all of that, that's just legal stuff, terminology, mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. Then we get to the meat. Here's the biggie. And these are patient access to record changes. As if we haven't heard enough about patient access to records. Yeah, they're learning a lot with that (laughs) initiative, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah, but this this first one here. Mm -hmm. mm. (laughs) Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And and what I'm, you know, there's a part of me that wonders sometimes if they propose things so that, Okay, we're going to propose dropping the speed limit to 45 on highways because people won't stay at 55. Okay, well, I'll stop going 80. I'll go down to 70 if you just won't drop it to 45 so that it's so far. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. I don't know. 
But this really does have to do with the intent of giving patients more involvement in their care, which does make sense. Gets back to the care coordination. All the studies show if patients are more involved in their care, then they are more healthy. So (laughs) all of this enforcement we've seen was because people couldn't get the complete record to somebody within a 30-day time frame. And there were a lot of problems. And Mm -hmm. we're going to keep doing this until people get the message. We heard that. Well, now they want to take that and shorten that to 15. Let's cut it in half. Cut (laughs) it in half. Yeah, it's it's not one of those things where they go, you know, you're doing so great with 30 days. Let's cut it in half. (laughs) (laughs) That's what I'm, I'm trying. But, you know, really and truly that you look at the numbers, my bet is that the vast majority of people are doing it within the first two weeks. And yeah. the ones that aren't are the ones that aren't doing it within the first 30 days. Yeah. So they're like, look, you're not going to do it within 30 days anyway. So yeah, 15 is not going to change. If we could say 15, maybe you'll do it within 30. You know, is is yeah. that what it is? Because right now it's 30 plus one 30-day extension. And mm-hmm. this changes it to 15 plus one 15-day extension. Mm-hmm. I mean, I still think that's reasonable. Mm-hmm. I mean, unless you're getting some major influx of requests for patient records. Well, everybody does. I mean, you look at some of these organizations, they have entire departments. That's all they do. Mm-hmm. You know, that's well, all I'm, they do. I'm talking about from a from a small practice standpoint. Yeah. Because the bigger organizations, you, you assume or you know that they have people dedicated to doing this. But if there's not somebody dedicated to doing this, I still think 15 days is probably... Well, you know, if we look at the 14 enforcement initiative cases mm-hmm. in this, there, some of the big ones, you know, there's some that are large organizations that were included in that. Mm-hmm. Theirs were incomplete records. They, they didn't keep up with everything. But I would say, without looking, and I should go back and look, but the majority of the ones where there's long delays, it was smaller practices. You're right. So it would encourage people to get all their ducks in a row. (laughs) Mm -hmm. So what we're saying here is we have been saying, make sure you're auditing and following up and doing the right thing on your patient right of access. And it would not hurt to start slowly reducing your time frames. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying. Yeah, because um, there's more. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> well, you know, the rest of these, these are kind of, I don't know. You know, one is that it providers to submit a request for records to other providers in electronic format to get it, you know, back and forth. And they need to make the request in 15 days and you need to respond within 15 days and it needs to be electronic. The next couple... <laughs> <laughs> Allow the patient to inspect their records in the office, take notes, and even pictures of their records in the provider office. Yeah, but now you're going in into logistics. Like, how are you going to do that? What, where are you? You know, it's like, okay, now I've got to have a room set aside, <laughs> you know, private booth yeah. that, you know, put people in so they can look at their records and take pictures and, you know, and what do you? How do you control well, see, the to records? Me, I see that more as something that happens in the patient visit. If I'm, a, yeah, if I'm yeah. updating records during the visit, there's no reason they couldn't do that during the visit. The question right. is when I'm not doing it be- during the visit and, and I'm not, I don't have access to it when the patient's near, I've got to have the patient has to have an opportunity to go do that. So you're right. So you, you tell them to, um, to request a, a meeting with the doctor. <laughs> well, but that's the in. thing. The, the, they're saying, let them look at the records right there. And do you control and how do you do? There's there's a lot there. There is yeah. a lot there. Yeah, because you can't just, I mean, especially if they're digital records, because that's what we've been pushing for years and years. Go digital. Can't just let them walk, have it. <laughs> somebody walks in the door and says, I want to I want to inspect my records. Uh, okay. Again, logistically, how are you going to do that? And how are you going to make sure those records don't walk out the door, whether digital or otherwise? 
I mean, there's exactly. a lot there. Yeah. There's a lot there to figure out. There's a out. lot of there there. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I know Cardin will have their finger on the pulse of this. <laughs> <laughs> That's just one that, you know, a lot of these I see as being pushed out. You know, where some of them will go ahead and be part of the rule and these will be part of the continued evaluation. Yeah. This is one of the areas like you probably remember this when the omnibus rule came out it's like everybody's starting to go now i've got to build this this big glass thing in my office and i got to build this wall and i got i mean all this construction was going on <laughs> <laughs> in all these offices to to uh yeah. follow those rules so this is another one of those where it's like oh gosh are we going to have to go back and and have people in here creating spaces for these things to happen so talking about having to build things and all of that kind of stuff, the next one is going to come into play with the vendors a lot, I think, anyway. Because if you look at the <laughs> – basically, it is clarify that if a provider has the technical capability to send records to a patient's personal health application – then they are considered readily producible. Hmm. Where, okay, there was this whole big thing that's going to be going back and forth on readily producible in electronic format. Well, yeah, technically it's in electronic format, and we could do that, but our, we don't know how or we haven't paid for that. So what they're saying is, is, is they have the technical capability then you have to provide electronic format for patients to import it into their own records. Is that within the same 15-day period? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that, mm. one, that one gets really – and that, like I said, a lot of these are very intertwined with information blocking. Mm-hmm. And that's why I'm like, I'm not really sure – we both know all the vendors have all these different things. And yeah, when you look at a large health system and hospitals, there's very limited. No, there's what, two, three vendors, you know, a mm -hmm. handful. Yeah. You know, five vendors, let's call it. But when you look at the provider side of the coin, there are so many different vendors on electronic medical records. Oh, yes. <laughs> And the capability varies widely. And I, I, I mean, I just think that's going to be interesting how they define technical capability to do this. Mm -hmm. So, again, this one, you know, vendors should be paying attention to this language as well as providers. This one, I was like, I had no idea this could, but clearly it has to have been going on. Reduce identity verification requirements to make sure patients are not unreasonably burdened to confirm their identity. And it specifically mentions in an example, not making them have a notarized signature on request for records. Huh? I can't, you know, yes, it says that we have to confirm the identity, but it doesn't, you know, there's some people where it's, you know, they're worried about, I don't, I don't know what they're worried about. But a notarized signature, okay, maybe if extenuating circumstances, I could see that. But, you know, not as a practice. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah, this is, this is probably where people have just, they're so scared of being sued that even the signature is not good enough. They want the signature notarized. Exactly. You know? Yeah. So, I mean, I can understand it because we – a lot of these places, they get you know pound into their head mm -hmm. that we've got to prove this, we got to prove that, we got to make absolutely sure that you know this is you are who you say you are, and your driver's license could be fake. We don't know. So. <laughs> I know, and that you know that's the other thing is I don't want to send a copy of my driver's license over. Yeah, you know? but yeah. I mean I don't know how it is where you are, but where I'm at. A notary's not going to give you any more validity than anybody else. Exactly, but it's going to cause me to spend a ton of time. 
Yeah. And and if I'm in and trying to get medical records, it's probably because I have medical things I'm trying to deal with. Mhm. So, that being said, that uh, to me that shouldn't be there, but anyway, specify when electronic records must be provided free of charge. Ooh. Mhm. You mean not even 650? <laughs> oh god. <laughs> I'll start that. No, no. <laughs> hmm. what is it? But then take it a step further and require CEs to post estimated fee schedules on their website for right of access request and for valid authorization disclosures. So both. Mm-hmm. And upon request, provide individualized estimates of fees for an individual's request for copies of PHI and itemized bills for completed requests. Ooh, all I hear is a bunch of extra work. Well, to me, if they give me a weird number that I have to pay to get my records, I'm going to ask for an itemized bill. I want to know what you're charging me for. Mm-hmm. And... You know, there's more and more cases in the, they're trying to push where it's about having electronic records that are transmitted electronically so that somebody's entering in a few things and we're not talking about all of the work that it used to entail. Right. And then if you get to that part, then that just becomes a cost of doing business and you're not having to spend hours upon hours on, you know, the pieces. However, to make sure that you do the right things, and I I can see why those businesses that do medical record management, why they are specialized businesses. Mm -hmm. Because they take care of all this. You know, you just, uh, release of information companies, they they just take care of it, and you, you don't have to have a department. You don't have to have... You know, people that in most cases, it's like you do this job, this job, and this job, and, you know, you can't keep up. These people, that's all they do, and they build systems and processes for doing it. And so I could see the value of that, and it would also make it pretty easy to then post, here's what it cost. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's just built in. So it'll be interesting to see, but they have been after the – Do it electronically. Give it to me electronically. The technical capabilities of providing it, if you have it, as well as what it costs and how long it takes. So we all know it's not as easy as a lot of people think it is. But at the same time, it's – I think there's a – this is the way we've always done it mindset as well without kind of tossing everything out and saying how can we do it better. And maybe that's what the release of information companies do is that they're actually doing that and tossing it all out and saying, let's make this more efficient. But those Mm -hmm. are the ones that I think are really, really, really big. Those are the ones that that section I think will end up being set aside because the next pieces and the previous pieces, they, they don't seem super... Unless somebody finds those things I'm concerned about and they can find a real problem, like I feel like there should be a problem there, you know, Mm -hmm. on those others. The last one's the one everybody's happy about, except for just, you know. Except for you. Why? What are you going to, because what are you going to do while you're in the waiting room now? (laughs) It's supposed to be there. (laughs) (laughs) I'm still going to do the same thing I always do. I just don't have to sign the paper. I don't get to walk up there and go, you want me to sign this, but I haven't seen it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that's the fun part. Well, I, you know, to, to some degree, for us, it's kind of one of those litmus tests, right? Right. Like we walk in and we ask for that, and uh, it kind of gives us a, an immediate gauge as to what your compliance program looks like. <laughs> Immediately. Because what we're talking about, folks, is the Notice of Privacy Practices, or the MPP. Mm-hmm. I'm down with the MPP. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so they're talking about eliminating the need to get it signed. Yeah, that piece of paper you sign at the doctor, that's what HIPAA is. That's what it is to most people. Yeah. Oh, gosh. How many times have you heard that that is HIPAA? Yeah. Like, 
as, as long as you sign that, you're good. Yeah. That's all you got to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and you know, that, that makes everything HIPAA. It's, and then the confusion of patients are bound by HIPAA, and that's the one where I'm like, <laughs> you know. yeah. So I'm always fascinated with all of the misinformation or uh, let's call it misunderstanding of what HIPAA entails. Mm-hmm. But the good news is let's eliminate that paperwork. Get rid of it. And then in exchange for that, there's one change, and, and I don't think it's – a big thing because it would make everybody go through and get it up to date because we still find some that aren't. But change the required header on the NPP because there is required information that goes in them so that it, and I, on this one, I pulled it exactly the way it's in the fact sheet that uh, HHS published. The required header would inform individuals that the notice provides information about how to access their health information, i.e. what we just talked about, patient right of access, how to file a HIPAA complaint, because that's almost always buried. (laughs) Why would you want to help people? (laughs) Let me show you how to file a complaint before you have a seat. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, but usually it's just like I go to the end and sometimes it's like, Three quarters of the way through, you know. Anyway. Yeah, and look, six font size. (laughs) (laughs) How to file a HIPAA complaint and their right to receive a copy of the notice and to discuss its contents with a designated person. Because technically it's there. I don't Mm -hmm. push that last part, (laughs) but I guess I could. It would just make people freak out. But then (laughs) it also says... Specify whether the designated contact person is available on site and include a phone number and email address the individual can use to reach the designated person. Now, that last little bit there, most people don't do that. They'll say, contact our office at this phone number or send us something in writing at this email address and ask for the privacy person. Mm Mm-hmm. So, hey, you know, I I like the designate. There's a de- I'm I'm not a fan of putting somebody's name in there. First of all, I don't think you should put an individual's name, but mm-hmm. you should put their title and a phone number and an a email address, privacy at whatever, and. Make it where people can ask you questions and understand what their rights are. Mm -hmm. You're much better off if you're handling that question and helping a patient navigate their rights than the other way around. So are we we also now opening up more risk and exposure with PHI with an email? No, because you're asking questions. About your privacy rights is what you're supposed to be asking. You're supposed to be asking questions about the content of the notice of privacy practices and understanding your privacy rights. Okay. So the person getting these emails, they're going to have to know what they can respond to or should respond to and what they should. Yeah. But that happens today, you know. Mm -hmm. It happens today because there are people who will go to – the website and send something in to whatever info at address that you have. And mm-hmm. then it ends up in sales and marketing or something, depending <laughs> on what kind of thing it is. But the whole idea is trying again to encourage patients to be proactive and participating in their managing their care, uh, understanding their rights and, you know, it also points out that another piece, it uh, proposes to modify the required element of an MPP that addresses the access rights to describe how an individual can exercise the right of access to obtain a copy of their records at a limited cost or in some cases free of charge and the right to direct a covered health care provider to transmit an electronic copy of PHI to an EHR in an EHR to a third party, i.e., 
Don't just say you have a right to get your records. <laughs> right. You know, be more specific. Now, the other thing I will point out, and we have been pointing out since they started discussing this, they've discussed this for years, is it has to be posted properly in your facilities. It has to be readily available at your front desk, if you will, where I can ask for a copy and everybody knows where one is. And it has to be prominently posted on the website. Mm -hmm. You know, I, the number of times I go to a medical website because we're working with them or sometimes I'm looking for, you know, healthcare information for me or my family and I have a hard time finding the NPP. <laughs> this is yeah, not a good thing. Almost always. Yeah. Yeah. You'll, you'll say, where's the link to the MPP? And they're like, oh, it's at the bottom of the contact page. Okay. <laughs> yeah, but then you go and it says privacy policy, and it's the website privacy policy. Well, that's not <laughs> I've what I've seen I'm those after. too. You know? I've, I've, I've seen the NPP mixed in with the website privacy policy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it should be, you know, here's our notice of privacy practices and, and mm -hmm. understanding you're right. It's, it should be easy to find. Yep. Make it make it big and bold. Yeah. And and it will reduce questions and improve patient care more than likely. At least make them more aware of what their rights are. Yep. Absolutely. <sighs> so there you go. There's your uh privacy rule proposed changes. Yeah, so when they go into effect, we don't know. But to prepare, number one, get your ducks in a row and follow the current right of access and get the fee sc uh, schedule and the ability to do uh, account for those fees, get your ducks in a row, get that done, done, done. Mm -hmm. And then number two, get your NPP posted the way it's supposed to make sure you know what's in it. Make sure that your staff understands, you know, most people never read an NPP and they've worked in health. Oh, I've been in healthcare, you know, 30 years and, Know all about HIPAA. Have you ever read an MPP? What? <laughs> Nobody reads that. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I that makes you a nobody. <laughs> I will admit that I have gone to and asked for a copy of it and a red pen and marked it up and right. left it with my paperwork. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how many names they called you as you left. Hey, I said, I'm not charging you for it. You know. <laughs> Hey, that's what you should do. You should go back and then send an invoice. <laughs> <laughs> you give me a hard time, I'm going to do it. <laughs> Here you go. All right. That is our show for today, folks. Remember to follow us and share us out on your favorite social media site. Be like Jack. <laughs> Maybe we should get some t-shirts made. Be like Just Jack. Jack. <laughs> <laughs> Rate us on our podcast and out. As always, we need your help to spread the word. Remember, for Donna and myself, the HIPAA is not about compliance. It's about patient care. You've been listening to the Help Me With HIPAA podcast, hosted by Donna Grendel and David Sims. The show created to help you with HIPAA. For more information or to ask us a question, visit our website at helpmewithhipaa.com. Neither Donna Grendel or David Sims are attorneys, and they do not offer binding legal advice concerning regulatory compliance. The information in this podcast should not be relied upon or construed as legal advice in any way. Consult your attorney for legal advice concerning compliance with HIPAA regulations.